It took Cromwell nine months to crush the royalist resistance in Ireland. Whatever his reputation was there, he returned to England to a hero's welcome. But the euphoria didn't last. Almost before the cheers died away, Cromwell's God began to test him again. If you're fighting battles and always winning them, you know that God is on your side. But in politics, where you have to negotiate, compromise, fudge, deal, God's will is very much harder to discern. In the two years that followed Cromwell's triumphant return, the army and the rump parliament remained bitterly divided. Cromwell had picked his soldiers for their piety. Now they demanded freedom to worship as they chose. But MPs feared religious freedom would lead inevitably to anarchy. Cromwell tried desperately to bring the opposing sides together. The reason that we took up arms. One of Cromwell's problems is that he, temperamentally, is that he can be very patient in trying to build up political unity, in trying to bring together people of different views, people who worship in different ways, and say to them, look, you have, what, what you have in common is much more important than what divides you. But then, suddenly, there are these dramatic, volatile changes. When it became clear Parliament would never allow religious freedom, Cromwell, as always, sided with his soldiers. On the 20th of April, 1653, he led the army into the House of Commons and disbanded Parliament by force. You are no Parliament. I say you are no Parliament. You are whoremasters and drunkards. I will put an end to your sitting. Call them in. Call them in. The rump is dissolved. The army came in. He, he threw away the mace that was the symbol of their power. What, what shall we do with this bauble? Did he have the authority? Not at all. But by this act, he had put himself in a position of unprecedented power. The man who'd fought for Parliament had now summarily dismissed it. As Lord General of the Army, Cromwell, once a Fenland farmer, was now the most powerful man in the land. Oliver Cromwell had to put his newfound power to use. He had to heal a battered, war-torn nation, and for once he knew exactly what to do. Twenty years earlier, when he was in the depths of despair, a Puritan minister had saved him. Experience. Then the Lord will manifest himself to his people. Surely such godly men could do the same for Britain. Cromwell asked parishes up and down the land to select pious, devout men to go to London and form a parliament of saints. This was what Cromwell had fought for, the culmination of all his dreams. He would give up power, and a pious parliament would create an earthly paradise free from grubby politics. His speech at the opening of this parliament revealed him at his most optimistic. I confess, I never looked to see such a day as this, when Jesus Christ should be so owned as he is at this day and in this work. This may be the day to usher in the things that God hath promised, which hath been prophesied of, which he hath set the hearts of his people to wait for and expect. Indeed. I do think something is at the door. We are at the threshold. The Parliament of Saints started well. They passed laws improving the conditions of debtors, prisoners, and lunatics. But the Saints had all too human failings. Radicals demanded tax reform. Landowners saw their incomes threatened. Parliament was once again divided. This creates not a paralysed body, as the rump parliament had been. It creates a body so at war with itself that it actually collapses, breaks down, tears itself apart after about six months. For Cromwell, the collapse of the Parliament of Saints was a bitter disappointment. He wrote in desperation, Truly, I never more needed all helps from Christian friends than now. Without either king or parliament, how would England be governed? 
Once again, Cromwell turned to God, and once again, God spoke through the army. Its leaders came to Cromwell with a proposal unique in English history. On the 16th of December, 1653, in a hastily improvised ceremony at Westminster Hall, Oliver Cromwell was declared Lord Protector of Britain and Ireland, the only commoner ever to become head of state. Cromwell insisted this was not base ambition, but divine necessity. I called not myself to this place, of that God is my witness. But it is sinful to be quit of that power God has most providentially put in my hands. I don't think for one moment he envisaged finding himself as the Lord Protector. But I think Cromwell was always ambitious in the sense that he wanted to influence. He wanted to perhaps to control. He wanted to help shape things. He wanted to have the power to do things. 